So, as I would say, I met with Julia early part of the summer this year, and one of the things that came out of having a conversation was we're losing a little bit of connection between the two and not really understanding what you guys are doing, what we're doing, and it became quite apparent in that conversation that it was probably time to do a refresher of new faces, new people. Um, I'm sure Francis Margie and will probably be able to critique this better than anybody and probably throw bits in that I've not put in here, particularly on the history. But really just to give you an overview of what we do, how we do things, and for you to think about when we're looking at um, potential projects going forward, is a way for us to tie in with you guys and is a way for you guys to tie in with your projects and research into what we do. So matching that up. So very, very quick history of the organisation. Um, so the Henry Double Day Research Association was what Garden Organics' former name was. Um, our founder, Lawrence Hills, was a real sort of um, pioneer at the time and he wanted to look at how we could improve health and well-being also and how we can improve the land. Um, coming out of post-war agriculture, um, he was looking at alternative systems at the, right at the birth of organic movements and, and alternative movements around agriculture in the UK and across Europe and, and the world. Um, Henry Doubledeer was Lawrence's kind of poster boy hero. Um, he did a lot of work around, um, Henry Doubledeer did a lot of research around looking for an alternative to gum for rubber for stamps. Um, and he was looking at Russian comfrey and looking at extracts and he used, used that. Lawrence then looked at the value of comfrey and look at the fertility properties, etc., to build fertility back into the soil. So, being a very mild and meek man, he didn't want to call it the Lawrence Hills Association, so he named the, the association after um, Henry Doubledeer. Our mission is for a healthy, sustainable world. Our vision is, sorry, is a healthy, sustainable world that's embraced in organic gardening and growing. Okay? What we want to do is basically get more people with hands in the soil growing organically. That's our absolute purpose. That's what we need to do. And we want to do that by promoting the benefits of people, plants and communities. And that's the key bit that we tie into all of this now. So, the picture at the top is Lawrence and Cherry, his wife. But our organisation started in 1954, formally constituted in 58. Um, and really, Lawrence was testing all his ideas. He had a, we had a site down in Bocking in Essex, and we were he was doing experiments on a very small scale around organic principles, practices, looking at the use of comfrey, looking at fertility of soil, really developing these knowledge and, and working with people. One of the things that Marty and Francis have been doing for us is looking back at our members' experiments over the last 60 years. We were pretty much at the forefront of citizen science, the protagonists of it, but at the time, Lawrence was quite frustrated because academia wouldn't accept it as studies, it wasn't scientifically robust enough, um, but we've but that was one of the, that's one of the things that we continue to do. And interesting, when you look back at our newsletters and our members' experiments, the, the stories and the conversations that go on. And I'll talk a bit more about members' experiments going forward. But what we did was, Lawrence's passion was for comfrey. He really bred and grew comfrey for different varieties. He tested its properties and he looked at how it worked and what it did for, for the soil and what it did for kind of all sorts of agricultural and, and horticultural uh, benefits. He named them all Bocking, so we have Bocking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 14. And Bocking 14 was the best variety that he developed that had the most fertility properties for soil. I think Bocking 3 was fodder for animals, it was a, it was a, it was a feed and a fodder for animals. Um, but Bocking 14 is the one that you can still buy today and is, is available commercially as a, as a variety. So, 58 all the way up to 1985 was in Bocking. In 1985, we purchased the site here at Brighton and we sold the site in Bocking in, in, in Essex. And these are some of the interesting first photographs that we've got. So here you've got the farmhouse um, and the old entrance in. And then one of the first things we did when we came on site was we built a, a house, a bungalow for Lawrence and Sherry, which is actually the back end of the kitchens here. Um, and you can see there, we moved to this site with nothing. It was a horse stud, um, so it hadn't been farmed particularly. Um, and it had an appeal for us to, to develop. The vision was to build the first organic garden that was publicly available to, for people to see, um, and it was also the vision to expand the work of Garden Organic as it was in the HDR as it was then, and to, to engage with people. And we picked a central location in the middle of the country so it was accessible to all. Um, the vision also then extended to doing more 
more work, extended Lawrence's research, and what he did, he brought in a really fresh faced young person who could lead the research forward. He's <laughs> And Marky joined the team uh, and started to focus a lot more on some more scientific type research and formalising it. And I knew she'd let me off with this, but she will kill me later. <laughs> it is my favourite picture in our archive. Um, but the real interesting thing was to take it as a major research option now, was to formalise all that really hard work, dedication that Lawrence had been doing, and then to make it into what he we could never make it, which was the formal academia acceptance of what we were doing. Um, Massive funding projects through MATH and DEFRA, and then it's obviously through the EU, through all its iterations. And um, looking at sustainability of organic, working with people like Soil Association, working with uh, the Organic Research Centre, peer review publications, producing them, developing them, making sure that we're at the forefront and adding value. And also some of the stuff that Julia used to do within the organisation, Julia's an ex-employee, um, was looking at the outreach work and looking at the research and, and, and working abroad and how we can bring some of that together. Not so much of that going on at the moment, unfortunately. So, our members' experiments, we run them still today. We still do that, that, that part that's very dedicated to our organisation. Our members are engage in it, it's a members only activity, but it's the birth of citizen science. We've been doing it for 60 years. And um, we've been engaging with our members to try and test and look at different ways of working. And I'm sure you've seen Margie and, and um, Francis's presentation on the 60 years of, of members' experiments. But it's a really interesting way that it's come round full circle to be kind of another another trend around research and much more much more accepted. It serves multiple purposes. It's great for our members for engaging it, but actually it provides a bedrock of knowledge development. We find out things, we test them in public, we figure out whether they work. That knowledge then goes into some of our training programs, some of our development work, and actually goes out into the actual into the wider world. And there's there's a, many things that have come as positives out of the research that we've been doing. And um, they come. The idea is started by coming from our members asking questions. And that's something we want to get a little bit more back to. We still take a nod to it, but it's a really interesting way to be driven by the people who are at the coalface who are gardening and growing all the time. That's one of the things we wanted to develop and look at it. So where do we go forward? Our research team, unfortunately, we couldn't sustain it. Most of you, we found a home that was brilliant. That was the home over here in the, in the university for it. And it sits better in some respects in that, in, in that way. But there is something where we can work more closely together. We have practical feet on the ground that go out and test whether that's programs, projects, members' experiments, 20,000 members, 40,000 people following us on social media. We have reach and breadth. So if you're thinking about research that needs to go out to the masses, there's a very good way for us to kind of help and coordinate around that. We want to increase our collaboration with academic research departments here, in the university with, with, um, with CORE, within Coventry University wider, and with other academic establishments wider still. It's part of our psyche, it's what we're here to do. We need to think laterally around how we can do that. And partnering up, I don't think the last time I ever wrote a, part, a, a funding bit that said, who are your partners? You know, it's almost par for the course now, you must have partners. So for us, that's really important. And we want to take those practical research outcomes and make them embedded in people's psyche. So the high level research is really good. We've got to try and work out what does it mean for Fred on his allotment and how can he use that knowledge and practice. So that dissemination now. So we can look at that breakdown quite interestingly and take that level of knowledge from yourselves or other academics and push it down and say this is what it really means and this is what you really need to change the practices. We want to continue and expand our members' experiments programme, and that's something that I'm looking at at the moment, looking at external funding to allow us to do that. And we want to increase the communication of our research out. How do we get more people to understand what the current research is? How do they make that practical application? And I think we're in a unique position to conjure at that. We've set up the Organic Horticultural Knowledge Hub, so we're scanning the horizon for publications that we think we can uh, um, examine, break apart and then put into practical terms for our members. And they're coming from all sorts of areas, there's just a few ideas up there, but certainly it's our bit to get more people to understand it better and to think differently about it. 
people have different levels of access to it as well through our website and through, through other areas. So again, a really interesting thing for you guys to think about if you have a funding bid that says, how do we get the core research into the public opinion? There's a way to do that with, with, with working with us. So, the bits of the area that I look after, Master Gardener, Master Composter, huge outreach programs, okay, developed over a number of years now, um, Master Composters started it, Master Gardeners followed on, basically training individuals in the community to deliver um, knowledge on a peer-to-peer -peer basis to, to, to the general population. Um, we're looking at all sorts of angles now, we get involved in health and well-being, child and obesity, behaviour change within people, we're working with drug and alcohol rehabilitation, we're working with food insecurity. There are a whole raft of ways that we deliver this program and the breadth that we cover. So again, something for you to think about around testing, how do you go out to people, how do you talk to people in general. These programs are really effective at getting people engaged in geography areas and also in, 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 in the country as well. Um, some of the things that we've, we've been concentrating on over the last five years around physical and mental health work. How can gardening improve the physical and mental health of people? Um, and Margie's been leading some work for us around uh, Growing for Health, um, but we've also been pioneering that work up in the prison at Rye Hill, looking at rehabilitation, but also on our horticultural therapy programs as well, which, are, which run from here and, and elsewhere. And one of the key things we've started to look at is working with the um, Social and Horticultural Therapy Unit within Coventry University, working with students, understanding a little bit how we can support and help um, and again a great way to look at some of the more natural um, natural environments and how you can use that to, to, to improve people's um, um, physical and mental health. We try to write in evaluations into everything we do and I know that you know we, we go to different departments within the university depending on who we need to do and it can Quite funny to me, I always say, oh, we get independent evaluations done, and I keep putting Coventry University independent evaluations down, you wonder how independent it becomes. Um, but the reality is where we can, we like to put in evaluations. We need to prove to the world, particularly if we're doing a pilot project, um, that, that our work is valued, it's got substance behind it, it's not just us saying it. So there may be times where we're coming to you and asking to commission you, can you help us with an evaluation and, and a project? And, and that's really important for us. Um, it makes it a lot easier to get people to take up on the early, early adopter programs if we've got the evidence base behind us and it's not just our evidence that we're saying it works. It's got some, some tie in. So this can be a two-way street of conversation. I know I've spoken to all of you about a couple of socioeconomic um, projects in the past and you know whether we could do the evaluations. But for us, it's about building that relationship. Who to go to? Who to go to for the right, the right ideas and the right evaluations? Our programs work. You know, the master garden, the master composter doesn't just work because we get engaged with loads of people. Doesn't get engaged because they tell us it works. It actually has got some substance and some data behind it, um, and that's the kind of thing that shows the behavioural change that we impact and the numbers up there. We'll show you that. Rye Hill is an adaption of the the master gardener program. So those of you that don't know, HMP Rye Hill is about nine miles up the A45 towards Rugby. Um, it's a Category B National Sex Offender Centre. So we're working with very naughty boys. Um, we work within the Substance Misuse Unit within that prison. So we work with some pretty troubled people. Um, they have, as part of the drug and alcohol rehabilitation, they have their, what I call their hard wiring, their psychotherapy with the do a drug and alcohol team, and then they built this amazing garden with our help and support. Um, but it's very much a prisoner's garden that they grow food in, they use it as horticultural therapy, social and horticultural therapy programs running there, and it's their headspace where they can let the hard wiring work. So if we can adapt a program to work in a category B prison that houses sex offenders in the drug and alcohol rehabilitation unit, I'm pretty sure we can adapt the program to go into any environment. Um, and that's got all its own special, special outcomes and benefits from it, but the, the programme, that's been reviewed by um, Geraldine Brown within the Social Justice Unit of Coventry University, so there's a, another link to you guys in, in the wider section. Food Growing Skills London, <coughs> it's just coming to an end, five years of lottery money um, and an independent funding year, um, this is looked at how we engage on, on massive scale, on metropolitan size scale, 
of getting into an area, working with schools, getting every school to start to grow food. We're not shy of taking on big challenges. Okay, as an organisation, we'll, we'll, we'll look at what we can do. So engaging, there's something like 2,500 schools in London. We've engaged with over 600 of them um, to get them to adopt onto, onto new, um, new ways of looking at working and new ways of gardening and growing and introducing it into the daily life. The spin-off of this is now a project called Captain Planet, um, which is sorry, it was funded by the Captain Planet Foundation. It's a project called Project Learning Garden. Um, and we've got the guys, the directors all from the US right now, they're in London now, running around with Colette, my head of education, looking at how we can develop that program even further. And that's taking the practical needs that schools have and actually translating it with kit, information, training, and getting them over that hump. Because the first thing is, oh, we don't have this, we don't have that. Well, actually, the Project Learning Garden is a real positive way. We're putting around about two and a half thousand pounds of investment per school to get them started to garden and grow. The spin-offs in this area now, the next development in schools, all the, all the kind of data, all the scientific data, all the evidence coming out of Public Health England is not only about getting kids to eat better, but it's about getting them to be more active. It's all about calories. It's about them reducing the calorific input, but it's about burning more calories. And we're running a pilot project in Birmingham called Move More Eat Well, which is working with Sport Birmingham, Sustrans, ourselves, um, the Northfield Eco Centre and a couple of smaller charities, local community charities based in the Birmingham area. And we're looking at getting kids more active, getting them eating better and getting them growing food. And that's where we see the schools programme, a strand of schools programmes going, is about addressing those big social issues that are coming from public health in and they're working around that idea. So for where we want to go, we continue to work in schools, we continue to work in colleges, we work in the workplaces. Margie's going to be presenting for us later this year um, with HSBC in Birmingham, um, part of their Health and Wellbeing Week. We've got a project with HSBC where we're designing two roof terraces and we'll be training their entire workforce to work in the garden so they sustain and run a garden um, within their own brand new building in Birmingham. Um, the Health and Wellbeing agenda is key to where we drive and how we move forward in this area. And we've got a lot of experience around physical and mental health. We've got a lot of experience around looking at obesity, stress reduction, social cultural therapy. And also we have had Master Gardener as a social um, prescribing model in, um, in South London. Um, so it's a really interesting, interesting angle for us to look at. The other thing we're, we're, we're really into is building communities. Um, and building that cohesion within a community, the engagement, and then bringing that big social change. And the Master Gardener programs, the Master Compost programs, and the Now Where Waste Less programs are really interesting ways to do that um, and, to, and, to, and to get people to engage. One of the big areas of the organisation, Hotis Seed Library. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that over in the back end of the building where we are at the moment, You've got 800 varieties of heirloom, ex-commercial, um, historic old varieties of vegetables that are no longer commercially available. We're a library, we look after them, we custodian those varieties, we grow them out, we are available to our members, and the reason we do that is to maintain the biodiversity. If we didn't do it, these varieties were lost, and we wouldn't have that natural gene pool to go back to. Um, so the Heritage Seed Library is core to what we do, um, it's just hopefully, fingers crossed, going to have a huge injection. We just put an heritage lottery bid in um, for the next six years. We're hoping that that comes off. And that's to do a massive seed search nationally. Um, we are aware that some of our older population, who were the dig to victory people, who are endemically connected to the land and now getting well into their 80s, they're stopping growing. Um, and we're really concerned that we could lose a real raft of biodiversity when those guys stop uh, growing. Um, so we're, we want to do a final push to really open that up and then obviously we do the characterisation and the grow out and, and then see what, we see, see what we find. The reason we brought this project much further forward than we were anticipating doing, um, we were asked to take on a variety of broad bean. It was, came to us. It was two surviving brothers of five generations of broad bean growers and they asked us to look at their variety to include into the collection. In the process of doing that uh, inclusion into the collection, one of the brothers sadly died um, and that leaves one surviving brother well into his 80s. 
And if he died as well and he hadn't connected with us, we would have potentially lost this variety of broad bean. Doesn't sound like a big thing, but when we've already lost 90% of our varieties over the last 50 years, that's a massive, that's a massive impact. And one of the things we want to do is stop that and get a, get a, get a hand on what's out there. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be able to develop the Heritage Seed Library further forward again, but it's a huge piece of work, so we'll wait, wait, we won't be bated breath for here. Um, our seed guardians, we don't do all the growing out our own, we can't do it, we, we grow about 180 varieties a year on site, um, but we have over 800 to perpetuate the collection. So we use volunteers, we've got about 180 um, seed guardians around the country, and some abroad, which is going to be an interesting challenge with Brexit, um, but we, we heavily depend on them to produce volume of seed for us. They're all volunteers, they bring them back in a voluntary capacity, um, and they grow out big varieties and do big growths and send us back uh, their varieties. Um, we want to extend our, her our heritage demonstration gardens. And one of the things we've been working with is working with potentially heritage sites around the UK to get heritage varieties on display to people. So it started with the Manoir Cas Saison um, in 2014. We helped Raymond design a garden. I think this is the Le Manoir garden here. Um, we've started, uh, obviously we demonstrated in our own garden. We work with Dumfries House in Scotland. We also work with High Grove House as well. Um, the National Botanic Garden of Wales has had varieties and some faggins in South Wales. And the purpose of that is to grow local varieties in local areas that are, that are from the same time period as that property. So that they've got a living demonstration that is agriculture and horticulturally correct. Um, not only geographically, but also within time. Um, and we're looking, part of the Heritage Lottery Project will be to extend that out. So we've already got um, a number of National Trust properties on board. I've already got um, the I've already got Eden, we've already got Heligan on board, and we've also got um, Lands, um, Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland on board as well. So we, we, we're trying to build up this thing that you can go to a heritage site, not only see heritage buildings or heritage activities, you can actually see heritage varieties as well. It's really important about getting the message out there. We campaign. Um, our mantra is that if it affects our members and it's, a, and it's an organic issue or it's a potential issue around the, the environment, the ecology, and it's got something to do with our, our mission and purpose, we'll campaign. So some of the things that we've been campaigning about recently over the past few years, planting productive material campaign around seed legislation, um, pollinators and neonics, and obviously the guys who serve renewals are really important to our members. We're a, we're a voice, we're not always the loudest voice, we don't intend to be the loudest voice. Ours is to add our voice to the, to the mix and to work with other people uh, and other actors on that. Um, but the same regulations, we work across a number of um, actors across Europe, we connected a network together, uh, campaigned quite heavily on it with our members, our members work to MEPs, to, to, to Europe, to, to really voice their opinion against the legislation. And fortunately, that legislation was shelved, and I guess we could claim the victory for it. We had a small part to play in it overall. Pollinators and neonics, obviously, massively important in an organic system, um, or not important in an organic system in the case of neonics. Our, our, our voice to our members, and our members' voice adds weight to other, other campaigns. So, Friends of the Earth campaigns, we work alongside, there's lots of different actors involved, but we make, make our members aware and make sure that they're aware of what's going on and how they can help and stop some of this going on. Obviously the glyphosate situation, the renewal of licences and extra renewal of licences and um, we're opposed to it. Um, and now through the last point on there, the organic alternatives are not always as sexy as a bottled product, you know, it's old or grease, a bit of hard work, you can't really market that. Um, but obviously we'd be interested in talking to people who have alternative organic solutions to this type of activity as well. Because it's all well and good saying no to things, but when people say, if we say no, what else do we do? We need the answers to be able to go back, and sometimes that's research, sometimes that's different ways of thinking. For the future, we want to look at specific topics that engage organic growers, that make them comfortable around what, what, we, what we do, how we lead on it. I put leading role in European campaigning, we do sometimes, but more often than not we link with people. And maybe in the next few years we don't do so much European campaigning. I'm sure we will. I'm sure it'll still be part of our lives and we will do that. 
<coughs> we have a history of pan-European collaboration, we have networks across the, U across the country and across Europe that we work with, and I know that um, Katrina is involved in a SCEP project at the moment, um, you know, Colette's finishing up her Erasmus project, so we have a lot of reach with other actors across the areas and in Europe as well, so we know, we know quite a lot of people in different organisations. Challenge or opportunity post-Brexit, time will tell, time will tell. Our members and support, as I alluded to it earlier, we've got 20,000 plus members, 40,000 supporters on, um, on, on social media and, and other channels, and um, then our members are loyal, they like us, they stay with us, they don't just join for a year and then leave, they join and they stay, they're knowledgeable, you know, they've got an incredible base behind them. Um, our support has been rapidly increasing, as you can imagine. It's much easier to engage with people and get people to follow you on social media sometimes than it's put pen to paper to join, but we're seeing that conversion start to happen on a more regular basis. And um, our members are responsive to the wider organic to the wider environment than the organic, and quite often they'll be bringing ideas to us. Um, sometimes things that we've not seen, you can't have eyes and ears everywhere, but we have 20,000 and 40,000 eyes and ears everywhere, which is quite interesting to try and manage and stay on top of. And everybody thinks that their voice is the loudest, but we, we work it out. They're still engaged in members' experiments. 60 years later, we've still got a cohort of people within our membership who get switched on by the members' experiments, bit, and that's really, really important to us. And, and it's a solid fundraising platform. You know, we can't do anything in this world that these days without money. It, as an organisation in the voluntary sector, money and funding streams are always interesting and tight. But they do support us and they do do that. Our current campaign in the summer this year is to continue our work around food insecurity in our Master Gardener programme in Southern. And that, that, that current fundraising uh, appeal is out to our members and it's just pushing over £20,000 at the moment. So when we ask them, they do respond and they do respond, do respond reasonably well. We want to build our membership structure. It's our core income streams is what we need to do. We want to increase our support and numbers. Our network of affiliated local groups is what we want to improve, and we want to keep supporting organic heritage around our heritage projects. So it's really important for us to continue to, to develop in those areas. Our local groups, so we have members, but we also have groups that are members. So we could have one membership, which is a local group, but it could have 40 or 50 organic growers underneath it. This is one of the areas we want to really push on. Um, going forward is to build this group network up, to build the social network in those areas so people can engage, they don't have to come to writing, they can be engaged in the organisation right on their own doorstep. And that's really key for our development going forward. Extra, bigger network of groups nationally, better practice sharing, more access to communities, more access to projects, more access to training, right on the doorstep for people. We communicate in a number of ways. I'm sure some of you have seen the Organic Way ma ma members magazine that goes out. Um, we've been revamping that over the last three years. The pieces in there are much more detailed now, they're much more horticulturally appropriate. Um, and we're, we're really pulling in some, some interesting stories around different people, their, their, their background, their history. Um, we're hoping that we can push that out to three to four copies a year over the next two or three years, which is, which is a really good, good message to get out to people. The other side of that is we've also got Chris now working for us as our head of organic horticulture. Um, those of you that have met him will know that he's a great mouthpiece, and I'm sure you won't mind me saying that. It's hard not to be engaged in organic gardening when Chris starts to talk. He's very enthusiastic, ex blue gardener, ex-head gardener at, um, at Westminster Abbey, um, and, and a really knowledgeable plant person, um, and, and really enthusiastic, passionate about getting kids into gardening. And Chris has been a real foil for us to do that. So where are we going? We need to increase our relevance in the organic growing sectors. There's the, the things like the, the legislation that's gone through the environment plan, the 25 year environment plan, things around the, um, some of the Brexit negotiations about whether we have a green Brexit and the announcements yesterday around the, the person's got CAP, etc. We're at that table, we are talking about that. James is going to meeting after meeting after meeting around those sorts of areas, making sure that people don't forget that probably the biggest organic landmass in the country is in people's back gardens. It's not necessarily the landmasses where we produce agriculture. And actually, if you want to have an influence, sometimes you can have an influence in the back garden space that we've got. Um, we just need barriers for people to become organic and become more organic. 
quite often, you know, people don't say, oh, I'll be organic, but I couldn't do this, or organics, I couldn't do that. That doesn't stop us from having a conversation. We need to have that conversation with people. Um, we're very much a sliding scale of green, rather than a black and white in or out. We talk to everybody, and really we talk to the light green end, the dark green end that are already doing it. We, they need help and support, but we want to be having that conversation at every end of the spectrum. Um, Practical support locally, regionally, getting people um, nationally involved, that's what we want to do. Showcase best practice, produce the projects, but most importantly is educate. Educate and change people's opinion, and that's what we need to look at and develop that side of it. <clears throat> so, it's kind of a whistle-stop tour of who we are. I hope you can see things that might fit in in future areas. The take-home bits for me, you've got a big organisation, just next door, that have got access into networks of people locally, funding accesses. And um, the other key thing to remember is we're an NGO. You're an academic association. You bid in for things and you need partners. Sometimes having an NGO is a real positive. We're also a company limited by guarantee. Okay, so we're a commercial sector organisation as well. And which hat you want us to wear, we're available. And I don't want to be ex exploited that before. <laughs> Um, has been in a commercial entity, but we are. So, from your perspective, if you want reach, you want to get knowledge, or you want to get test beds out into society, we're a really good foil to be able to do that. Um, we're also quite knowledgeable about being able to collect data and bring data back into you as well. So our members' experiments are, our methodologies around that. So there are ways where we can get general popular opinion quite quickly, um, and you've got access to that sort of thing. But really, from my point of view going forward, it's about communicating. If we know what you're involved in before you come to do it, then we can talk to you about how we can help and shape and, and possibly add value to that. And that's really the bits that I want you to, to, to think about when you come to look at funding opportunities or project opportunities. You know, A, we won't be scared of a conversation about it, and B, there's always a way to try and fit it in, and if there's an angle, we will, we will be able to do it. We're adaptable, we're, we, we, we can adapt our programs, but we're also quite pragmatic around how we do that. And I think that's sometimes a, a, an added advantage. But, but have a think, have a you know, look at it. You know where we are. You can always get in touch with us through Julia or anybody else, and we, we can talk right at the beginning. It's easy to do things if we talk at the beginning rather than try and shoe on something in halfway through a project. Thank you very much.